Good evening. My name is Shani Pai, and I'm the program director at Town Hall. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle and Grist, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual presentation with Dr. Rupa Maria and Raj Patel. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that Town Hall stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We are so glad that you tuned in tonight. The presentation will be about 60 minutes, including Q&A. Please note that the Q&A platform for Town Hall events has been updated. To submit your question, please enter meet.ps backslash maria. We'll drop this link in the chat and remind folks again when we get to the Q&A about where to go. We can't guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. You can help us by keeping your question concise. And for those of you who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall's work is made possible through the support of audience members like you, along with sponsors of, their of our science series, Microsoft, the Norcliffe Foundation, the Neshholm Family Foundation, Caffin Foundation, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so we thank all the members watching from home. If you share in Town Hall's vision for a robust community engaged in the arts, science, and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider donating or becoming a member. You'll want to dive deeper into the issues Rupa and Raj raised tonight by purchasing a copy of their book, Inflamed, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. Please use the link in the chat below to pick up your copy through Elliott Bay Books. The authors will be in conversation tonight about their book, Inflamed, with Brady Pinheiro Walkinshaw, CEO of Grist.org, the leading national environmental media nonprofit dedicated to climate, justice, and solutions. Before joining Grist, Brady served two terms in the Washington State Legislature and was previously a program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He is active on several national boards and advisory groups on issues of climate, equity, and justice. Well, thank you so much, Shinyi. Thank you so much, Town Hall. It is wonderful to once again be hosting an event with this terrific local institution in Seattle. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined by two really wonderful guests who we're going to dive into conversation with uh, here in a moment. But before we do, I'm just going to take a moment and share with you a bit about each of their backgrounds. And I'm going to start with uh, Rupa Maria, um, who is, I'm not sure how the tiles appear on your screen, but I see her to my left. Um, Rupa is a physician, activist, artist, and a writer who's an associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. And she's the founder and executive director of the Deep Medicine Circle. It's a worker-directed nonprofit committed to healing the wounds of colonialism through food, medicine, story, learning, and restoration. Um, and in this year, she, she published her first book, which we're going to spend the next hour discussing, along with her co-author, Raj, who I will introduce here in a moment, um, but she has spent her career working on issues of social advocacy and health and has spent quite a bit of time working with indigenous communities um, where she lives, um, where she lives in the Ohlone territory and in places where she served, such as the Lakota territory. Um, she spent time in Standing Rock, which she may speak to, and um, efforts during the protests related to the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and at the invitation of Lakota elders, She's continuing to help develop a clinic to decolonize food and medicine in the Lakota territory to serve the indigenous communities. Um, I'm really excited to be in this discussion um, and welcome Rupa to this conversation. Uh, and secondly, um, and equally, I'm, I'm excited to have Raj Patel also joining us. Um, the genesis of this was that Raj and I um, spent some time together at a film festival, a mountain film in Colorado, where he had a, a film that he'd recently produced um, called a film we'd recently produced called The Ants and the Grasshopper. It's an award-winning documentary um, that was filmed over the course of a decade in Malawi in the United States. And he'll, he'll speak to some of that um, in this time. But today, Raj is a research professor um, at the School of Public Affairs at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, he's joining us from Austin. Uh, he has degrees from Oxford, the London School of Economics, Cornell. Um, he spent time working at the World Bank. And one of my memories is that Right out of college, I actually worked at the World Bank, and, and Raj had just, with some co-authors, had published this series of books called Voices of the Poor, which at the time was really challenging kind of orthodoxy within the World Bank around really listening to clients, really thinking about listening to the people who the World Bank was hopefully working to serve, which were <coughs> poor people around the developing world. 
Um, and Raj was part of publishing a series of really important books um, that influenced the bank um, and development institutions around listening to the poor. Um, so I'm really excited to have the two of them in discussion around this book, um, which we are going to spend the time speaking about. And the title of the book, which you can see in the, in the background of both of their um, screens, uh, is inflamed, which is deep medicine and the anatomy of injustice. So maybe just to kick off, um, let me turn it over to Rupa. Um, you're a physician. Um, tell us, tell us how you came to this theme, and tell us why you, why you decided to to work on this project. Yes. Well, um, it's hard not to notice how people are getting sick, and um, I work as a hospital medicine doctor, and I and I often think of hospital medicine as having, you know, a privileged access into looking at the bleeding edge of society, you know, who's getting hurt and how they're getting hurt and what they're getting hurt by, why people are getting sick. You see everybody in the hospital. It's the great democracy of illness. Um, but although it's not so democratic because you'll, you'll see people disproportionately impacted by these sicknesses. Um, and it was really through my work as a traveling musician with my band, uh, Rupa and the April Fishes, we would be touring around the world. And I use music as a way of um, looking at the impact of society on health. Um, and when you travel as a musician, as opposed to like as a researching doctor, um, people open their homes to you and you get, you know, just beautiful access to communities and listening um, and, and exchanging cultural exchange around music and what's going on where you're at and, and what are the challenges. And um, over the course of several years, as we tour, you know, eventually it'd be like med students coming out to tours, um, to shows in, you know, anarchist squats in Athens as the financial collapse was happening. They'd be like, come and see our pop-up clinic, come and see what we're doing. And as I was doing this, I started to notice, you know, that there was really a disproportionate, um, rise in these certain kinds of diseases um, in people who were most oppressed by their social conditions. And over the last 10 to 20 years, those diseases have all been identified as diseases where inflammation is playing a major role. And so um, when Raj and I met to talk you know, about looking at the you know, health impacts of racism and, um, you know, the impacts of colonialism. I was just giving a talk on the Dakota Access Pipeline and, and the medical response there and, and the unbelievable police violence that was encountered not only there, but also, you know, in San Francisco, which was being actively gentrified. Um, so, um, you know, Roger's like, well, let's sit and think about, you know, a book together. Um, and it was really a great gift to write this book with Raj because I couldn't have written this book by myself um, and nor could he have. And it was really the mixing of our minds and our understandings um, where we um, you know, advanced in a, a concept of illness and health that I think can be really serving to a lot of the movement work that is happening around the world for the dignity of the earth's health and the, the dignity of um, people and their health. And Raj, I mean, a lot of the work you've done over the years has been on food systems. I mean, tell me, share, you know, how did, how did you arrive at this kind of concept of inflammation, which I think particularly we'll get to the relationships with COVID, but it's been spoken about so much more over the last year and a half. Well, you know, I mean, it, for, for people who are interested in food, um, and th thank you for, for mentioning that, and also thank you just for the very generous introduction, and thank you Town Hall for having us, it, it, it is good to be back. Um, even in the confines of this box. But th thinking about um, you know, food systems, people have, may have come across things like the, the anti-inflammatory diet. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's a thing and we could possibly get into it a, a little later on when we're talking about the microbiome. Yeah. But for, for me, um, you know, I, I've been doing a, a, this work around food systems for a while. And, you know, it was only through this conversation with Rupa that uh, you know, it, it, what was unlocked for me was a, a recognition that the conversation about food is always a conversation about health, except in the US where you have to add health into your food. So, you know, food only becomes healthy when it has added vitamins, uh, which I think is the received pronunciation, uh, and uh, the, you know, or, or, you know, some sort of 
perk to it. Otherwise, food is there to make you sick, and then you you take medicines in order to to remediate the the effects of food. Uh, but in you know in every culture that I've been lucky enough to see uh, uh, and to be a part of, and you know as part of this you know the the, the idea of of what are the voices of the poor saying uh, among the things that they're saying is look th this boundary between food and health is uh, artificial. Um, it's policed in uh, uh, in ways that are not healthy uh, and. You know, peasant movements around the world have um, you know, important understandings of how it is that the food that is produced and eaten and the mechanisms through which food circulates in communities are also and must always be healthy for that community. And that's that's something that we sort of lost sight of. And um, so the, the work in the food system for me was always work about health, but I didn't really know it until you know, working with Rupa, we managed to smoosh it all together and uh, and put it under the the, the the sort of interrogative banner of infl inflammation. And, and make the connection for us of, of kind of food to inflammation. Well, what inflammation is and what was so interesting about this idea is that, you know, as we were looking at how social oppression was impacting health and then seeing, noticing that there were all inflammatory diseases and then noticing that, you know, people with certain access to certain foods or not access to other foods were becoming inflamed and then noticing how soil was becoming inflamed um, and how the guts of my patients who were going for, you know, to have their intestines removed from inflammatory bowel disease, that the stool microbiology of those patients looked like the soil that had been blasted in the Central Valley by, you know, decades of pesticides or petrochemical application. And so starting to ask these questions, you know, what, what is this, um, what's happening to the earth's body? What's happening to our bodies? And how are these things related? And, um, you know, what started as an investigation became a really um, powerful um, hypothesis and so much of the data that we looked at, especially coming out through COVID, just reaffirmed this idea. Um, and so inflammation is this response the body has, the immune system has, it's tied in with the nervous system and the endocrine system because even the um, sectioning off our bodies into these systems is a false um, way of organizing ourselves. Um, these systems are all interrelated and interconnected. But it is, we, for simplicity's sake, we'll call it an immune, the immune system's response to damage or the threat of damage. And um, when the body encounters damage or the threat of damage, the inflammatory response is what tries to set the body right. It's a healing response. Um, and it restores what's called homeostasis, our optimum working conditions. And then ideally it turns off. Um, but what happens when the damage keeps coming um, to the body, whether it's through stress or trauma or racist police violence or uh, debt that you can't get out from under or a petroleum pipeline going through your only source of drinking water or um, intergenerational traumas? What happens when the exposures of the body are such that the damage never stops? And what we see is that inflammation runs unabated. And that those groups that are um, exposed to more and more toxic damage, whether it's air pollution or pesticides or dietary chemicals or all of these things, um, heat, excess heat, which is something that we're seeing now in Seattle, just in the Northwest this year, um, hundreds of people dying in the Northwest from these heat waves, um, that sets off a, a damage signal, inflammatory response. Um, and so you know, the more additive those responses are, the more inflamed the body becomes. Um, and COVID just proved this, you know, again and again, severe COVID is a um, over, uh, an over exuberant response of inflammation in the body. And those bodies that are sort of primed, or I call it like tuned um, to a toxic set of exposures have a more robust inflammatory response in the face of something like COVID. Um, and so how do we then look for health outside of just an individual pursuit of like, well, let me just eat an anti-inflammatory diet. How do we actually reharmonize our bodies with a, a world, shape the health through reshaping the world? Because the bodies are not acting pathologically, they're behaving normally to a pathological world. And that is a way of understanding health that is not ours. This has been articulated by many, many thinkers before us. Um, but we did pull together the science, like where the science has add from ecology and from um, medicine to um, push this understanding forward. 
um, we need to stop thinking of health as an individual pursuit, um, especially, I mean, what with what the earth is shouting at us. Well, I think that, I mean, Raj, do you want to add anything to that before? Oh, no, 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 I, I think that that's perfect. Well, you know, I think one of the broad themes in the book was how you were both kind of diagnosing kind of inflammation affecting the planet, right? That the planet is unwell and that the human body is unwell and the connection between those two. And I, I think that that one of the pieces that I was going to bring up was, you know, how did you see, how did you see kind of the inflammation? I mean, maybe talk a bit about how you would describe the planet as, infl as inflamed. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, what one only has to uh, open the window in, um, in Seattle to, to, to get a whiff of that, right? I mean, you know, it, it, uh, we are living uh, amid these, uh, world-changing wildfires, uh, you know, and where the northern tip of Greenland now had rain for the first time in recorded history, where, you know, we are seeing these epic wildfires, not just in the United States, but uh, through Siberia, through recently, you know, through, through Europe. Um, and, you know, the, the way in which uh, our, you know, the surface of the planet has been rendered um, you know, ready to, to combust through centuries of combustion. Uh, is a way of describing the planet as inflamed, um, but it's not merely through fire that you can you can find inflammation. I mean, R Rupert was just talking about the soil, uh, and to, to look at the way in which chemistry has burned, uh, you know, life from from the soil uh, and is doing the same in the seas uh, is another way of another lens through which we can see uh, that you know the, the 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 surface of the planet is being oxidized in one way or another uh, now that's uh, you know that's just one facet of uh, you know of uh, the, the the way that, that climate change is happening but climate change isn't just weather uh, climate change is about the social responses to the the sort of these systemic flips in the weather so right you know, right here in Texas for example we had the big freeze um, which is the opposite of burning and is exactly what climate change and inflammation um, you know can nonetheless look like right we, we have the big freeze that then results in a cascade of uh, a failing power system because of the way that our capitalist markets are disorganized um, in order to, to provide for maximum profit and no you know reliable uh, electricity and then of course uh, who is it th that suffers the brunt of that it is precisely those communities whose lives have always been considered disposable under capitalism uh, you know the, the frontline communities the elderly the poor uh, and those communities were the ones who in, invariably died uh, in, in our uh, moment of climate apocalypse here. So to think about inflammation is not merely to look for heat, but it is to look for um, the, the, the areas of friction uh, in which uh, you know, capitalism has put uh, frontline communities up against the, the sort of grind saw of climate change. And I would say to add to that, Brady, is that um, is that it's to look for damage. And um, like we we're saying, the inflammatory response is a, is, a, is a sign that there has been damage. And what colonialism and capitalism have done is they've damaged critical relationships that supported our health and well-being um, in our interrelationships with each other and the earth systems. And when we're talking about inflammation in the book on, on a planetary level, I just wanna be clear that we're not speaking in metaphor. And let me just give a quick, a quick example. So going back to the soil, when we say the soil is inflamed, but what happens to the gut when the gut is inflamed? Um, the junctions between the cells become leaky. The gut can't absorb nutrients. Um, we can't, um, we start to hemorrhage. Um, the things that we need, the vitamins and essential micronutrients that are supposed to come from food into our body. The gut is the interface between the outer world and the inside world of our body. The soil is that interface between the inorganic world around us and the plant matter, and that becomes eventually our food. So when soil has been blasted by petrochemicals, um, what it loses is the um, soil architecture of life, the microbes, the mycelium, cilia um, that translate um, inorganic nutrients into, um, into the plant. And so the soil 
leaches water, the soil can't hold on to water, the soil aerosolizes dust, it starts losing CO2. Um, and so it does the opposite of what a deciduous forest system does. That soil sinks it back into the ground and holds the water and holds the nutrients and, and transmits it to um, the different plants through the mycelial web. Um, and so when we look at the soil like that, it is inflamed. It has that same damage response that we're seeing in the human body. And I, I just wanted to make that clear because throughout the book, um, I've seen a couple of reviews say, oh, and then they wax, you know, metaphor. And like, these are, um, yes, we are both have our art artistic inklings and we're not, you know, above metaphor. However, um, if you talk to any ecologist, they would understand um, what we're talking about when we're talking about the blockages of rivers being like the, you know, the cardiac event um, for the earth. These are systems of circulation of resources that have been um, incarcerated through capitalism. So I want, to, I want to come back to that and kind of this, maybe in a few minutes, turn to kind of solutions and kind of at the base of this, I think there is a very, you know, this is a critique of colonialism, a critique of capitalism. Um, but before we do, I wanted to talk for a bit about, and you started to go into it, but the microbiome, and it's, it's spoken a lot about in different ways. Um, and just wanted perhaps you'd explain maybe how, how do you, how would you define the microbiome in your work and in the book and kind of how do you see it playing into the systems, both pl planetary and soils and so forth, but then also within the human body um, as you've been thinking about inflammation? Well, I, I think it's the microbes world and we just live in it. Um, so they've been here much longer than we have. They know how to organize. They're extremely um, um, adept at um, evolving and sharing their genetic information and tools and expressions and um, living in every niche of, of the earth from the deep sea, where I think German companies are right now trying to patent the microbiome down on the sea floor, um, which is just beyond, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just insane. Um, but but the microbiome is, you know, on the on the human body, it's all the organisms and their genetic material and their, you know, little fragments of DNA and RNA that are living on and around and inside us. Um, that we have now come to understand are absolutely essential for our health and well-being. That our immune system, our endocrine system, our nervous system are being programmed by these entities inside the, the you know, the intestinal folds when we are inside our mother's uterus. Um, they used to think the uterus was a sterile place. They used to think the whole body had these sterile places. But in fact, we know now that every organ system has its own microbiome. Um, and that those organisms are in relationship with us, whether, you know, we know that they're there or not. Um, and so what we talk about in the book is how vital these relationships are for us and our um, denuded microbiome. So the most uh, denuded like felled forest, um, if you think of the microbiome as a healthy forest, um, belongs to uh, U.S. urban dwellers. So people in the United States have the least biodiverse gut microbiome on planet earth. And the gut microbiome we now know, um, a robust and biodiverse one is um, necessary for combating inflammation in our bodies. Um, it's also necessary for proper brain development, um, proper endocrine development. Um, and without that, you know, we, we really don't stand a chance against inflammatory disease. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting um, question for us that we bring up in the book is like, what is the individual if ourselves are so dependent on millions of organisms to even be healthy, to even have a chance at health. Um, and so, um, yeah, the, I feel like microbiome science is showing us how we need to um, conceptualize our health as ecologists, even as physicians. Um, and we don't do this well at all in, in medicine where we focus on individuals. And when we focus on individuals, when these are systems level failures, um, we, we are almost, um, you know, blaming the victim for why they're sick. Um, and that, that, you know, that is something that we take to task in the book. Raj, do you have other things to add about the microbiome that- well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I certainly don't uh, think that, that, you know, the, the capitalist approach is the way to go. I mean, it's just super interesting that, you know, what we're trying to recreate by, um, uh, you know, adding to our microbiome uh, is, 
you know, these ancestral organisms like, like we're trying to create sort of Jurassic Park in our stomachs. Uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, in, in our stomachs, the, the ancient, uh, the microbes run free, but uh, of course, you know, they die as soon as, <laughs> as they interact with the rest of the planet that, that is out to kill them. Uh, and I think that there's, you know, uh, unless we get those relationships back, um, you know, relationships that uh, are conducive to what is inside us living outside us um, without being constantly supplemented, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not really addressing the problem. We're, we're just sort of patching uh, an inevitably broken system. And over the last, I would say over the last, like, and this might not be the wrong historical frame, but over the last couple of decades, especially the last 10 years, I felt like the microbiome has been discussed a lot more in different ways, both as kind of solutions um, to various kind of, you know, food production questions or human health questions. Why, why do you think that is? That just advances in the science or, you know, what, what do you think is driving, like, you know, what do you think is driving this discussion around the promise of, of really looking into the microbiome? Well, well if you look at uh, oh, please. I, I, I don't really to Maria. Sorry. No, well, if you look at people who have um, not been colonized, no. um, so look at the indigenous people in the Amazon, the Yanomami, they have hardly any incidence of inflammatory disease. They don't have cancer. They don't have diabetes. They don't have cardiovascular disease like we have. Um, they die mostly of pneumonia. Um, as they grow older, they don't use antibiotics. They don't have they don't have um, exposures to these these things. They have a biofilm on their skin that protects them from skin cancer and from sunburning. They never sunburn. They never ever sunburn um, because those microbes on their skin are protecting them. And you know, one shower, one shower, and that biofilm is gone. Um, and, and not just a shower, but a shower with soap. Um, and so I think that we see that these organisms are um, really uh, powerful. And the problem with medicine and science is that we really go to, for a pharmaceutical approach. Like, oh, okay, well, if these microbes are, are healthy and these people have healthy microbes, let's just, you know, grab some from their feces and, you know, make a pill and everyone can have this rewilding of the gut, which we saw this article in the New York Times. But but in fact, that's an erroneous thought because the Yanomami gut is that way because of how they live, because of a system of relationships. And that microbiome is a reflection of those relationships. And that's what we get at in the book is that it's a system of web of relationships that we need to re-enter in order to, to potentiate our own health, um, as opposed to, um, you know, just popping a, a you know, Yanomami gut microbiome pill or product. Um, and so the solutions that capitalism will, will offer are always going to um, put away uh, or just hold off at bay any promise of real health for um, as many people as possible. And so that's what we're hoping to, you know, sidestep and go more to where, you know, people can all be healthy. Um, and, you know, I mean, and in, in, in the end, end game of, you know, popping uh, someone else's poop in order to uh, rewild your gut is sort of the, the, the logical outcome of, uh, as you say, you know, the, the, the advance of both, you know, uh, inquiries into what's going on in our microbiome and you know, a, a deeper understanding that we are not just individuals, but we are sort of holobionts is the technical term. You know, human beings are, are not just human beings, but all these other uh, more than human things that are on and in us. But it's also you know, a response to the fact that since the 1970s, we've been, you know, our, our dietary diseases um, have been killing us. And, you know, I mean, US life expectancy has been falling since 2014. Um, and, you know, but even before that, looking through the 70s, 80s and 90s, we saw these precipitous rises in uh, things like type 2 diabetes and heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, sorry, uh, uh, and, and uh, certain kinds of cancers uh, that were associated with diet. And all of a sudden, you see at the same time, the rise of a wellness industry that's going to juice you back to health. Um, and, the, you know, you, you can understand, you know, the, these uh, vendors of, um, you know, of goop, uh, as the the sort of capitalist corollary of uh, an understanding that our so, there's something wrong and it is broken and it needs to be fixed. Uh, but the, you know, since we can't think our way back into uh, wholesome relationships with the rest of the planet, all we can do is administer tinctures um, of various kinds of strange elixirs uh, to, to make us feel better. But uh, it is both, you know, to, to answer your question, Brady, about the the origins of this, uh, a, a a sort of 
clarify for the audience, say a bit more what you mean there. So you're talking about actually therapeutic companies that are actually developing therapeutics for microbiome. I mean, well, I mean, it, it, it's both the, the, the rise of therapeutics that are offering to supplement our microbiome right. uh, with things like fecal transplants, um, right. which is a thing. Uh, and in some cases, you know, it, it, for, for the treatment of things like C. diff, it is uh, a, a, a legit treatment, but it's a treatment that uh, doesn't address why C. diff is running right, why our internal microbiomes are, are, are so dysfunctional in the first place. Uh, and for, for that sort of deeper analysis of why it is that our guts have gone awry, um, there's no amount of either, you know, sort of uh, just, just popping poop pills uh, or, you know, again, the, the rise of certain kinds of health adjacent industries that are um, offering certain kinds of wellness treatments uh, as, a, as a way of abating inflammatory disease, but never actually addressing the systemic and societal reasons why those inflammatory diseases exist in the first place. So that's, uh, and sorry, sorry to be cryptic about that, but that's, thank you about that. Thank you for, for bringing that, uh, that, that point to, to the surface, Brady. Um, you know, really since the 1970s, while our diet, uh, you know, while our chemical industry and our diets uh, have broken our bodies, our responses to them have always been along this sort of narrow consumer focused uh, approach rather than being allowed to take the step back and ask these bigger systemic questions about what might change. So same I want with to the climate. The, oh, go ahead. Right, no, same with the climate industry, Raj, just to piggyback onto that. It's like we, we, we talk about going green with our uh, electric vehicles. We don't talk about you know how the indigenous led pipeline resistance has cut greenhouse gases from the US and Canada by 25%. So if we're really serious about this, we would all be getting out and joining the grandmothers on the front line stopping line three. Um, and that, you know, it's important to um, understand that these things that are given to us as solutions um, are not really getting at the deep medicine, which is the structural change that will allow us all to be, you know, living on a planet that's not inflamed. So I, I want to get to that structural change that you talk about, which is, you know, how you connect back to solving why our guts have gone awry. Um, but before going there, I just wanted to talk for a moment about this connect these connections um, that you have, have brought up and talked about around the connections between the pandemic and climate change um, and how you have seen those from the perspective you've brought around inflammation. And just wanted to see if you, you, know, you wrote this book, you both wrote co-authored this book during the pandemic. Um, you know, the, 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 the climate crisis, there were so many aspects um, related to the climate crisis um, that we experienced that coexisted with the pandemic over the past year and a half. And just wanted to see if you wanted to comment a bit on that before we got to more of the structural critiques in the book um, around colonialism and capitalism. Yeah, well, I mean, um, you know, for me as a frontline doctor, he's going back into the hospital on Saturday, I'm gonna get my PPE out and um, head back into the wards. It's, uh, first of all, it's mind boggling that we don't seem to know how to act in the face of data. Um, so we collect all this data around, you know, climate change, the temperatures, um, and we don't really do much with it. Same with our health response here in California, we're learning that it's healthcare executive lobbyists who are determining our public policy, not the nurses and doctors on the front line who are taking care of patients or patients themselves who you know, want to make sure their healthcare workers are vaccinated and they're gonna be safe when they're in the hospital. Um, we didn't get testing at my hospital as man like mandatory twice a week testing, which we've been asking for since the beginning um, when the NFL was getting tested. And we know that you know healthcare workers were spreading it in the hospital. Um, and so, these kinds of things, um, you know, the relationship between the pandemic and climate change um, really show me how systems level derangements require systems level solutions. And those will not be advanced by entities that have an agenda with colonial capitalism, keeping those structures in place. And so where will they come from? They'll come from the undercommons. They'll come from the people on the ground who are doing the work. They will come from the indigenous grandmothers who are standing in front of line three right now. Um, those are the people who understand the kinds of systemic transformations that we need. And it's a good time to start leading by following their example and thinking about how to build a world where care is centered over um, any profit motive of any you know you know bright person who wants to fly a you know giant penis shaped you know rocket to the moon as the rest of us are just trying to figure out how to get PPE and make sure everyone gets vaccinated on planet Earth so we can get get done with the 
been done with this pandemic already. Um, so, you know, it's a good time to put these sociopaths in their place um, so that we can advance a, a health agenda for everyone on planet Earth. Provocative. I want to come back to that in a sec. So maybe Raj, if you wanted to comment on that, I was going to uh, do, you, did you have anything you wanted to, to comment on around the pandemic and climate change? Well, I mean, you know, again, I mean, th think about who, who gets sacrificed uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in the pandemic. Uh, here in Texas, uh, the hotspots uh, were prisons and uh, slaughterhouses. Uh, and uh, that's not a surprise, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the are two sort of institutions of of, of incarceration, you know, of, of, of uh, sort of close proximity and of the management of dangerous bodies in one way or another uh, that are immensely profitable to, to this particular state. Uh, and look who's in the prisons and look who's in the slaughterhouses. It's, it's disproportionately people of color and then slaughterhouses also disproportionately uh, women. It's always the working class. Uh, and those are precisely the bodies that were tossed on the pyre uh, of, you know, of, of protecting the middle class, whether in the United States or elsewhere in the world. Um, and look again at who it is that's going to be suffering the brunt of climate change. Uh, you know, the, the rule of thumb with climate change is if you had absolutely nothing to do with it, you're first in line. Uh, it's you know, an, an inverse kind of relationship to your capacity to avoid it and to cause it. Uh, and those kinds of relationships only obtain because of the structures of, of capitalist exploitation that have, have existed for the past 600 years and the ways of thinking that normalize you know, and make it okay for us to, to, you know, to all say, well, of course we must have our meat because, uh, you know, in the pandemic, what small comforts we need rely on the, you know, on the production of JBS slaughterhouses or Tyson or whatever it is. Uh, and therefore, you know, the Trump enacted these emergency legislation, you know, this, this emergency legislation uh, in order to make uh, slaughterhouses an essential frontline facility. But, you know, whatever it is, you, you can figure out who it is that's insulating the middle class from the full effects of the pandemic or climate change or whatever it is. So I'm gonna intersperse, just wanted to encourage the audience to ask questions. We've had a, a few great questions coming in. Um, I'm just gonna to turn to a question from the audience here that was around US life expectancy uh, that you're bringing up. And the question was that you mentioned that US life expectancy has been declining in recent years and it's been more unique to the United States. And the question was really around our, our, our political systems are, that are producing economic inequality and this kind of question of, do you think inequality kills? And I it's that kind of pointed, but how do you see this relationship connecting inequality um, and inequities in the United States back to, to inflammation? Well, I mean, you know, inequality has been killing uh, people disproportionately in the United States for ages. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it, 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 I mean, it, it ought to have been a, a constant uh, source of shame that particularly for black women in the United States and particularly black women in particular parts of the United States, uh, their uh, maternal mortality rates were uh, on a par with those uh, of middle income developing countries. Uh, and yet, you know, th th that was okay because it was them over there, but now we, we've been seeing these broader trends uh, in, in, you know, creeping up from frontline communities to uh, everyone in the working class and now the middle class, and now it's time to panic. Uh, and it, it's important to remember that, that the frontline communities that have been uh, addressing these deep health inequities in the United States for decades um, were warning us all along about the way that, that uh, the United States bought its, uh, you know, bought its comforts at the expense of certain and communities. Um, so you know, that, that, that's one thing, but it's not just the United States that's seeing these declines. You know, we're, we're seeing them also in the United Kingdom. Um, and for uh, you know, inequality absolutely has a, a story to, to, to tell here. And I, I, I know that, that you know, I mean, one of the stories that we tell in, in the book is, is, is around what one of Rupert's patients who lived you know, and then died through this inequality. And I, I, I don't want to, to take that story away from you if I know if, 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 if now's a good time for it. Yeah, no, I had an amazing uh, patient, uh, Shilia McCarley, who was born and raised in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, um, drinking out of the toxic, polluted Tennessee River, uh, Tennessee Valley, uh, the river, the watershed. And um, that watershed has been polluted by, you know, chlorine factories, by 3M with their forever chemicals. And she grew up drinking the groundwater and eating the catfish. And by the time she was 40 and moved to California, 
Um, she had joint swelling and her hair was falling out in a rash and they called her lupus, um, even though there was no signs of lupus. Um, and when she was in the ICU um, at UCSF for five months, she was in and out of the ICU with these, these bouts of inflammation where she looked like she was infected. We never found any infected organism, um, but her markers of, of inflammation were off the chart and she was behaving like someone with a systemic inflammatory response. Um, so she go in and out of the ICU, put on pressures, put on antibiotics back and forth. And after five months, she just, you know, was done. And I met her in the last two weeks of her life and met her son who walked in, you know, gaunt 30 something year old uh, white guy from Alabama with, you know, white supremacist tattoos around his eyes. Um, and I just sat with both of them and asked them what their lives were like. Like, what is the community you're living like? And are people dying there? And what are they dying from? And and it was an amazing, you know, hour long conversation with this family after which uh, the young man came out of the room and collapsed in my arms crying and saying, no one has ever asked us what our lives are like. No one has even bothered. And when you think of that, the poisoning of poor people in the United States, no matter what your color is, this is something that the Black Panthers Party was organizing around very um, intelligently, working with the folks, poor folks in Appalachia, um, understanding that the plight of capitalism and the, uh, the racial capitalism of this, how this society is organized, grinds a lot of different people under its wheel. Um, and, and in order to overturn those systems, we have to start working together. And that's exactly what, you know, the Trumps of the world exploit so that we don't, so that we end up focusing on hating each other. Um, but when this man, you know, collapsed into my arms, heaving and sobbing, um, I felt like that was the healing of this nation. That was it right there. It's like, okay, how do we see each other? How do we recognize how we have been, how our health has been actually robbed from us. And how do we work together collectively to demand the right to be healthy on a planet that is healthy, on a planet that will be healthy for our great grandchildren? How do we work together? And those um, concepts and ideas are really coming from indigenous people around the world because they've been doing it for thousands of years. Um, and it's not some sort of romantic notion that, oh, they just know how to do it. And we all gonna go back and live in grass huts, um, but it's following their science, following their understandings, following their cosmologies, following um, how they know how to organize, what they're doing on the front line in Ecuador, in you know the Amazon, um, in India, um, all over the world where their lives are being threatened because they steward the greatest range of biodiversity in their bodies. They know how to do that. And that's not just some woo-woo thing. That's thousands of years of science. Um, so what we do in our book is really look at like, who are the peers that should be admitted into the conversation on peer review? Who are the sciences coming from? What are the knowledge systems? How do we start weaving together a much more sophisticated basket of knowledge um, around what can get us through this dire moment in human history um, with the promise of health for people, for everybody, and the promise of health for all the ecosystems and all the entities that our lives depend on. And uh, I, I, sorry, Brady, I, I just just to, to sort of, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think that 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 last point Rupa made there about for everybody, I think is, is sort of central here. Um, you, know, you, you asked in, in your question, well, you know, how does inequality kill? And, you know, Part of that, part of the mechanism in the United States and to some extent in the UK um, is through the despair that comes with debt. Uh, now, of course, you know, the, the US is, is a particularly weird place in the way that we regulate or don't uh, pharmaceutical industry, you know, the pharmaceutical industry. And so we're all paying the, the, the very high price for um, the Purdue settlement. Uh, and the Sackler family running off with their billions. Um, but you know, w one of the ways that inequality features in that story is through the kinds of toxic financial product that the, the American working class are exposed to. Things like payday loans. Uh, for, for people who don't know, like a, a payday loan of $300 uh, can result in, in a payment of a repayment of $800, so an APR of, of so 400%. Um, now, if we were to abolish those payday loans, suicide rates in the United States would drop by 2.1% and uh, fatal overdose rates would drop by 8.9%. Now that's very important because you know, ending this particular engine of inequality and despair is 
both a, an economic uh, move, but it's a health move. And look at how re, you know, removing this loan uh, and this sort of predatory loan mechanism is also a way of you know, depriving the pharmaceutical industry of uh, its sort of its quotient of despair that it, it ends then to, aims then to medicate, right? If, uh, if, because these loans are in communities that are desperately uh, you know, at the very sort of uh, thin end of, uh, of, uh, of income uh, and you know, we live in such an unequal society that we feel okay in the middle class for this this hat this this sort of uh, scalping to happen for the working class. Uh, then we allow these this, this, these toxic financial products to spread. We allow this despair to, to fester. And then uh, you know what should happen, but uh, you know the, the the right kind of environment in which uh, the drugs of despair and addiction uh, find their home. And so you know, getting rid of inequality not only sort of stops um, the, the circumstances in which the Sacklers get to make their billions, but also uh, is precisely part of that indigenous wisdom that is about everybody. And that's how ending inequality can also be a, a way of, of, you know, pushing back up against this, this kind of reckless inflammation. And then we go to, when we talk about debt, sorry, Brady, this is how Raj and I wrote the book. We just sat around talking to each other yeah. every day no, for a year. Spread, I had a question, so. but, yeah. um, but when we talk about debt and we look at debt, you know, not just only in, in those circumstances of the most desperate, um, you know, trying to get their payday loans, but we look at student debt, right? right? So we are saddling, if we know that debt is a pro-inflammatory agent and we are starting the careers of our young people leaving university saddled with debt. So we have just prescribed the limits of their own health by the financial system around them. This is a case to you know, go on a debt jubilee, just cancel all the debt and see what happens to the health of the people. Um, we deserve that. And, and, and then to define predatory lending as student debt, like why are we predating on our young like this? Why are we not um, you know, giving them the benefit of their open future um, with an education. Um, so it's really an exciting time to demand um, what is, I believe, rightfully ours and our, and, and our children's. So just to take, you know, I'm sure your, so your book, as you've likely met, whether you're in social circles, talking about your book with friends, you, you probably meet or with fellow academics, um, you probably meet or fellow physicians, you probably meet critics along the way. Um, and people who might be critical of different aspects of the thesis that you're advancing. And some of those critiques you might kind of write off as, as you know, thinking that it might be coming from a really capitalist perspective or you know, coming from a worldview that doesn't align with yours. But how do you, what are some of the critiques that you wrestle with the most that you, that you, that, that you worried about in, in writing the book um, that you thought had credence, but that you, that you sort of disagreed with? Like, are there, were there critiques that you really wrestled with um, as you were developing um, the, the book? Mm. I would say one critique that's come up, which I thought was, uh, you know, I, I think about, you know, Raj and I give a lot of time uplifting stories of indigenous communities um, because of our work with them. So we've interviewed a lot of uh, folks who I consider elders in my world, um, people who have educated me, um, who, you know, didn't write the book with us. Part of that is all of those people I know were running mutual aid groups and everyone was like totally stretched thin. Um, and they didn't want to sit around writing this kind of book. Um, but I do think about the importance of authorship of Indigenous people. And while Raj and I are not Indigenous to, you know, this place or even, you know, we come from, we're both children of diaspora, we're both um, children, you know, refugees of colonial terror in one form or another. Um, I did sit and think about that a lot and, it, you know, I would love to follow up um, this work with deeper engagement with the groups that I work with and and also amplifying more their work and and how I believe that um, so in my own work as a scientist as a doctor as a activist um, what I've been learning from those folks like right now with Sage La Pena, an incredible California native uh, plant medicine woman who's working with me on decolonizing medicine practice on the coast as a part of the deep medicine circle. 
just such a wealth of information. Um, and so that's, that's something I think about and I keep coming back to is like, what is the role of authorship? I mean, I hate the word author because it suggests authority. Um, I'm not an authority. I'm a, a dreamer and a practitioner of deep medicine. Um, and I, and I, um, yeah, I just think about that with, with this work more. How about you, Raj? Yeah, no, the same thing. I mean, you know, w w while we were writing this, I was um, also just finishing off this this documentary, uh, Brady. That you, you know, we 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 met uh, in the course of it, its screening, and you know, the, the ants and the grasshopper um, was co-directed by me and Zach Piper, um, and we had long conversations around how it was that you know, yes, we co-directed because we, we've been following this story for 10 years, but you know, in the end, it was someone else's story who we were following. What's our relationship to the person who was on, uh, on screen? And so in the end, of course, uh, what we did was uh, a, a, a big step, but not quite enough to, to, to say, well, all right, look, she, she, it was narrated by her uh, and uh, the, the person who did the translating and did the, the filming and the, the producing started off as our driver in Malawi, but you know we we, we worked with them so that they became uh, a you know a, a, a above the line as it's called a, a filmmaker. Um, but we recognize that this you know that this film is a step towards decolonizing, and so you know we also uh, you know as part of our uh, completing grant for the film also fundraised for other communities who appeared in the film to make their own films and tell their own stories and do it in a way where we developed a legal toolkit for them to own their own stories in future and that's one of the ways in which you know works like inflamed and you know also uh, you know the, the, the thinking about the ants and the grasshopper uh, are certainly for me a, a, a way of, of like you know yes but you know we've got to own it uh, own the, the, uh, in our contribution and our responsibility for this but also, you know, also you know, raise the money and, and take a step back. And I mean, that's that's what I'm, I'm super excited about uh, the deep medicine circle and the work that you're doing there, Rupert. I'm, I, am, I, I confess uh, an interest. I am, I am the treasury owl for the deep medicine circle. So I, I'm, I'm encouraging people to uh, go to deepmedicinecircle.org and give generously. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I think one of the, the important parts of the work of decolonizing is recognizing one's position and recognizing the, 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 the way in which the platforms that we, you know, that we have have are ones that ultimately need to be the subjects of, of class suicide. Yeah, I Nick, to call please. I was going to no, encourage any final audience questions as you were as you were going into your response, please. Um, yeah, and so for me also thinking critically, and this is something that I do on a daily basis on what decolonizing means for medical practice. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, how much can you really do within the system? And how much do you have to do by building a new world by building a new, um, a new thing. And that, um, for me has really come down to you got to build the new thing. And while I'm there, and I'm, you know, just got off the phone, an hour meeting with, you know, 10 young health students with the Do No Harm Coalition um, that I helped, helped organize, um, I can see that they're so hungry for something different. Um, and we're still a part of this archaic system. So how do, you, how do you be in it and not of it? How do you be in it and a fugitive from it? Um, that is uh, probably, I think, what I feel is the most profound question of our book that irritates me all the time um, is that fugitivity and um, how we um, simultaneously live our lives and, and start creating new systems that will cause the old ones to erode because they're just not as awesome as what we're building. So that's that's a good in our closing in our closing minutes here. We'll see if another if more questions flow in. But um, in our closing minutes here, I would love to just hear what you see as the solutions or the path to how we do kind of systemically address inflammation. Um, is it and you get into it in your book, but thought it would be great if you could speak some to that. Um, well, I mean, yeah, the, the uh, we're, we're fans of understanding decolonization as uh, sort of radical acts of care, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, one of our heroes in the book uh, is the, the the theorist of of colonialism, Franz Fanon, who was also a practicing doctor and a psychiatrist. Uh, he, he tried initially to decolonize the hospital by actually believing his patients, which is which is a problem in medicine, um, where you know so, so much of it is. 
uh, you, you know, so much of medicine is about silencing the patient because they don't know what they're, you know, what, what they're suffering. Um, and Fanon was, you know, centered patient knowledge about and, and patient cultural interest in their own healing as uh, as the, the, the mechanism through which transformation might be achieved. Um, but in the end, he had to walk away from the hospital because as, as he put it, the doctor also owns the land. And transforming those relationships of ownership and power are, uh, you know, seem very abstract, but they're, they're central to, to big policy ideas that are already on the agenda, uh, the agenda, like the, you know, the red, black and green New Deal, uh, you know, policy proposals that are about transforming uh, our world into a relationship that's about care and repair, about, uh, you know, caring for one another and engaging in fixing what is broken and uh, engaging in radical reparation. I mean, you know, Brady and I uh, are complicit in the, the, the World Bank's extraction of, uh, of, of resources from the global south and, you know, reparations from the global north to the global south is definitely a part of that that idea of care and repair but you know the policies of the green new deal are very practical uh in insofar as they are global and reparative uh to to yeah, actually engage in this sort of decolonization and address inflammation and i see that um um in the chat there was also a question about the allostatic load of um systemic racism that are disproportionately impact black and indigenous people here it's in the united states um so that allostatic load, um, so the, the additive effect of stress that is compounded in the body um, by uh, daily acts of discrimination, uh, by systemic racism, um, those are part of what we described earlier as the damage um, that is around the body. Um, and Black folks in the United States experience a lot of that damage, and it does add up in a burden, and it starts from even, you know, when you're a fetus um, through one's life. And that's not a biological determinism. It doesn't have to be that way if you dismantle those structures that are causing that allostatic load. Um, you will see a relief in those inflammatory diseases because you don't see those same diseases in Black Africans where the structure around them doesn't contain that level of toxic racism. Um, and so when we talk about inflammatory disease that are caused by that kind of allostatic load, what we are talking about is, you know, cardiovascular disease, cancer, autoimmune disease, um, inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, COPD, Alzheimer's, all of these diseases that Black um, folks experience more, um, um, they're impacted disproportionately by these diseases in the United States. And so, you know, when we look at the health disparities and we say, oh, well, this is, you know, this is going along, you know, by race and we're looking with COVID, oh, well, black and native people, you know, the academic medicine has diagnosed that system, you know, structural changes of structural disparities are what, what are leading to this disparity in racial outcomes that we're seeing with, um, with COVID, medicine never goes that extra step in going, and the diagnosis is this, and therefore the solution is let's dismantle those structures that are creating these poor health outcomes. We just stop at, oh, look, there are these health differences. And that's the problem. That's where medicine becomes complicit in upholding and invisibilizing the social structures that are making people sick. And that is unacceptable. Um, and that actually shows how medicine itself is a part of the colonial project and the colonial logic um, where, you know, black and brown folks won't get the same kind of health care as white folks. And they never have and they never probably will in a health care system that's organized through colonial um, mentality. Um, medicine was part of the colonizing project. It's, you know, it was the missionaries, the uh, military and the medics that were here. And those medics were here to keep the colonizers healthy, not to keep the natives healthy, unless there was an infectious disease that happened to spread. Um, and so we're seeing that same mentality play out today. And we have to recognize the colonial roots of medicine um, to understand, you know, why is it that black mothers are dying in the rates that they are, that black babies survive three times more if they have a black doctor? What's that about? Um, you know, that just speaks to the level of anti-black racism that is um, just suffused at every level of medicine, not simply just, oh, people don't have access to care or they're living in a neighborhood where these things are going to be worse. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, medicine itself is complicit. And, and we take that to task in our book. So maybe if you could each just close with just one minute on a hopeful note about what is giving you um, what is buoying you um, in these times as you as you're as you're doing this work, and then I will pass it back to our colleague Shen Yi uh, at Town Hall uh, to offer some closing words. But thank you all for joining us this evening.
Thank you. I would say what's buoying me is the students, um, the medical students um, who are young and they are so bright and so um, literate around the power structures that are making people sick and they are sick of it. Um, I've just never seen so much um, outrage at how um, how unfair um, these health outcome and these disparities are and, and such passion and um, motivation to, to fix it. Um, and so I feel a lot of hope working with young people and working with indigenous communities who are, are teaching me so much about, about the path to a healthier world. And, and Rupa, not to keep the spotlight on you, but if you don't mind, there's a great question that just came in in the chat from a young research scientist that I think is in the spirit of what you were just saying. I don't know if you'd what does like, it say? Like, I can't see it. I'll read, I'll read the questions. So just so grateful uh, that you all came tonight and can't wait to read your, read your book. Um, as a young research scientist trying to contribute to decolonizing science and med medicine, uh, what wisdom would you share? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say get yourself a circle of other people who are interested in this practice, a learning, unlearning circle and and start meeting up and having these discussions there's a lot of um, online circles i really enjoy <laughs> meeting together but this is work that must be done in community it can't be done alone um, don't think you can fix it by yourself because you can't um, and so get involved in these really deep deep and rich relationships with people who are doing this work and it's it's the most exciting intellectual, uh, artistic uh, healing work I've, I've ever done. And, and that's what really gives me hope is seeing the, the limitless, limitless, li limit, <laughs> limit, I don't have any limits to the imaginings um, collectively of, of what we can do to, to make things better. Raj? Um, I mean, God. Ditto. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the work that's really sort of buoying me up at the moment is uh, the work around agroecology, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a global movement that involves 8 million farmer groups, not just 8 million farms, 8 million farmer groups getting together and investigating everything from soil microbiology to how to end patriarchy. And these are all investigated by the same farmer research teams as you know, you know, you're looking at the, the people who are doing the intercropping are also the people who are tackling patriarchy. And that understanding that the peer review process can and should involve everybody is precisely how to decolonize science, but it's also a message for all of us to transform the world. It's actually incredibly empowering to be a research scientist involved in the work of social change and the laboratory as our planet, as it always has been. Uh, but now, you know, what, what I'm excited about is that there are so many millions of people who are recognizing that we can become scientists together for the good. So thank you, Brady, for, for bringing us here. And yeah, thank you, Shunyi. And th thank you, thank you, thank you, um, thank you both for this, this great discussion. And thanks to all of you in Seattle for joining us. And Shunyi, back, back to you. From all of us at Town Hall, thank you for joining us this evening. Remember to pick up a copy of Inflame from Elliott Bay Books by clicking on the link in the chat. Thank you, Rupa, Raj, and Brady. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.